Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Quebec City Councilor David Weiser, the birthplace of French North America and the only walled city north of Mexico. Quebec City is an open air treasure chest that will delight history and culture buffs alike. Its European background and modern North American character are set off by a heady blend of history, traditional and contemporary art, and French language culture to make Quebec City a destination like no other. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Quebec City Councillor David Weiser. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by asking a simple question, but it's an overarching one to kick off the interview. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, David? Oh, boy, you want the short answer, the long answer, or let me make a long story <laughs> short. Um, I grew up in Quebec City. Okay, My father was born in Quebec City. My mother was born in Mexico. Grandparents from both sides were from what today would be the Ukraine, which was the Soviet Union. I'm part of the Jewish community. I did my studies in English here in Quebec City. So I kind of make the joke sometimes and I'm kind of like a multicultural community all to myself. But in other words, I grew up in a predominantly French speaking um, city, uh, which was after the quiet revolution came out of being a Catholic, very religious city. Um, so I, I kind of grew up knowing what it's like to be different yet integrating into this wonderful city. Um, for when I was in uh, high school, for example, all my friends, you know, celebrated Christmas, of course, and I celebrated Hanukkah. So at one point, I remember in uh, first grade of high school, I invited them to the synagogue to see how I celebrated Hanukkah because I wanted to share as well. When I had the opportunity to start the first video game studio in Canada, right here in Quebec City, when I was 19 years old. And the reason behind it was to create a series about a character who traveled the world, discovering different cultures to introduce kids to different cultures around the world. And I'm sorry to, to make this a lengthy answer, but it's part of why I got involved in politics. So stayed in technology for most of my life, lived four years in Montreal, four years in Toronto, came back to Quebec in 2009. The city had changed. The energy was so different after the 400th anniversary of the city. Um, and then all of a sudden, 2017, we have the attack at the mosque, uh, where six of our citizens were murdered. Uh, and that greatly affected me for two reasons. One, of course, because Quebec is such a peaceful city where there's hardly any crime, but more importantly, because it was targeted towards a minority. So I stopped all business activity and started getting involved in community work in what we call vivre ensemble in French, which there isn't an accurate English term for it or, or a term that reflects the same thing, but the closest thing would be social harmony. Um, diversity was new to Quebec City. In the 80s, for example, there were only about 3,000 immigrants, and today there are well over 65,000. So it's been the last 20 years that there's been a lot of change. And uh, I decided to get involved to, to organize events, to, to, to start an organization that would organize events to facilitate the meeting between people from different backgrounds. Because I do believe that's the only way you can attain social harmony. It's not theoretical, it's practical. You have to meet people that are different overcome your fears, which are normal because intuitively as human beings, we're afraid of the unknown, but we're supposed to be intelligent enough to get over that. But the only way to do that is to meet people. So I got involved, did a couple of projects with the city and uh, the outgoing mayor's uh, team back in 2021 asked me if I wanted to get involved. And I thought it was a great way. Uh, specifically, it asked me if I wanted to get involved to put in policies for inclusion, and uh, ensemble, as I mentioned. Um, it'll give your your uh, your listeners a bit of French there. Uh, 
And uh, that's how I got involved. And I ran and got elected. And uh, that's how I got involved, really, for the Vivre Ensemble. So first off, I, I'm just going to put this on the table. And I, I mentioned this a little bit in our in my exit, but I'm going to mention it right now as well. Um, I, I know I've done a bad job on this show of trying to connect with Canadian municipal leaders from across this country, particularly in the province of uh, Quebec. I've made a pledge, and I'm making a pledge right here, speaking to the uh, Quebec municipal leader, that in 2025, I'm going to conduct a full interview and multiple interviews in 2025 in French with municipal leaders from across Quebec. So I will do my best because I think it's important for uh, a show like this who talks to all Canadians from coast to coast to coast to speak in languages that are represented. And French is one area that I, Quebec is one area that I want to dive into. So I understood it. <laughs> Can I speak it? Not as much as I think I should right. be able to. So that is my there's goal no, by 2025. <laughs> there's no time like the present, Chris. Uh, we can start right now. Si tu veux, on va, on va y aller en français. No, no, I'm just joking. You know what? When we, we met at FCM, right? And I thought it was so wonderful to see everybody who, all the speakers, make an effort to to address the crowd in French. And uh, so it was very interesting. And I, we could probably have a, a, a four-hour podcast on the language issue, but that's not the point of this one. But that's great. Thanks. No, and I appreciate you taking time to do this. I want to get back to your story, though, for a second, because I, I traditionally don't do a lot of research on my guests because I want to learn from them, just like my listeners are learning from them. But I did do a bit of research on you, and I found that you you have an entrepreneurial background. How does a guy who starts the first gaming company in Canada become a counselor in Quebec City. Was politics discussed at the dinner table? Was politics something that you were interested in? Or was it something that was, as long as it's out of sight, I'll vote in every election. I, I, I'm i not going into that arena. Where did your political bug come from? Well, interestingly enough, I remember uh, our grade six elementary class where we had to do sort of a little poster that said what we thought we were going to be when we grew up. And then the, our classmates would say what they thought we were going to be. And uh, I kid you not, I had written uh, either a lawyer or a politician. And my classmates had said, he's probably going to do video games, which is really, really funny. Um, so I, I've always been involved in my student councils, uh, present at, uh, at the high school level, at the SAGEP level, which we have here, which is between high school and, and college. Um, but no, I was never all that interested and uh, again i had a bit of an odd career path because at 19 years old I, i'm the typical college dropout because i had my business my video game business that just sort of took off so um i was just in that direction life leads you in a certain way and you kind of follow that path until something happens that makes you change i guess so so no it was never uh once i started in the technology industry it was never really a thought that i would get involved in politics yeah i voted and that was pretty much it and what, what was the reason behind getting into the municipal sector? Because your background seems like it would be perfect for uh, provincial or even federal politics. But in 2021, you made the final decision to go municipally. What was that decision based on to go start municipally rather than the other levels of government? First of all, that's very flattering. Thanks. Um, I think you mentioned it. I'm an entrepreneur and things move slowly when you're in the government. And I knew that going in <laughs> that I would have to deal with that. So there weren't any surprises. Uh, but I think the municipal level is where you can really uh, affect more change. You're in contact, direct contact with your citizens. And I think it's easier to navigate and 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 make positive change, whereas I think it'd be more difficult to provincial or, or federal. And to be honest, I, I never really had an interest. It's it's only because my passion became. I love my city. Quebec City is a fantastic city. Um, I think when I started back in my business in '91, it was before the whole dot com era. The, the, we didn't have the support system, the ecosystem for entrepreneurs that we have now. And I think it's just a way to give back. And that's what attracted me to it. And again, like I said, I was approached by the outgoing team as well. So had I not been approached, I'm, I, I think I would have continued in doing community work. But this is a way to sort of, like I said, try to put politics around and policies, I should say, sorry, um, uh, to improve inclusion in the city. So it was where my heart was. And it was a great vehicle to be able to pursue that work. So in November of 2021, three years ago, almost three years ago as of this recording, you are elected to your first term. You're serving your first term as we speak right now. 
What's been the biggest eye-opening experience from yourself? Because you talk about the the the, the pace of government, which let's be honest, and it's not unique yeah. to a Quebec city. It's a thing that I hear a lot from a lot of municipal leaders. But for you now, being in the sort of chambers, working alongside other uh, municipal leaders in Quebec City to dictate what goes on, what's been the biggest? Oh, didn't expect this to come up in a municipal realm. This is really interesting. I thought this was interesting myself because it surprised me. I never would have thought it. And it's maybe kind of not, I don't want to say a warning, but a heads up. So in Quebec City, we have uh, political parties at the municipal level. And I know that's not the case. It's not everywhere in Quebec nor in other federal uh, other cities across the country. I didn't expect, so I, I was an athlete when I was younger, played hockey, basketball, you name it. And you sort of get that competitive, visceral you want to win, you know, when you're when you're a fighter and you want to win. I didn't expect to feel that in council chambers. When we have our city council, it's as emotional and as competitive as one would feel when they're playing sports. And that was my biggest surprise. I didn't feel that I, I didn't expect that at all. Because as I mentioned before, I knew that the system was slower and you've got this sort of their teams in place and a lot of committees and et cetera, et cetera. But that was my biggest surprise. Oddly enough, I know that's Probably not what you were expecting me to say, but that was my biggest surprise. It wasn't, but now that you've mentioned it, I want to ask a follow-up question to that because you chose to run for, and I'm going to apologize if I get the name of the party wrong, the Quebec Fort de Fier party or the Quebec Strong and Proud party, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Uh, actually, no, I, I ran with uh, Marie-Josée Savard, who was... Okay, maybe uh, I read the, it wrong on the Quebec City I, I, website. No, I do apologize. I I did switch, uh, which is sometimes seen as a no-no, uh, especially, I think, at provincial and federal levels. But in all reality, uh, it was a really odd election in 2021 because the media actually announced Marie-José, who was the candidate selected by the outgoing mayor, uh, Regis Labaume, uh, they actually announced her as the winner about an hour after the polls started to be uh, were, were closed. But then there was a shift, and uh, Bruno Marchand won the election by about 700 votes. And uh, he appointed me still as a, an associate member of the executive committee. Everybody knew that my platform personally was inclusion and vivre ensemble. And, um, but the thing is at the municipal level, as I mentioned before, I'm not sure about the political party system because even if you have completely different ideologies, you don't have the means to carry those out. Uh, you don't have the budgets, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're mainly infrastructure, right? Um, so I stayed on as a associate member of the executive committee, but it was difficult because I had access to confidential information that I couldn't share with my party. I also thought my party was playing with small time politics sometimes, and that's not what I, why I got involved. I, I don't consider myself a politician. I'm an entrepreneur, as you mentioned before, and I wanted to make things happen. So uh, I wanted to get to know Bruno and his team. And then six months into it, more or less, I, I changed parties. And he asked me to take on also economic development, which was fantastic. I love having my feet in two silos, one which is more social development, the other one which is more economic development, make sure that those communicate. So, Well, I, I appreciate the clarification there. Getting yeah. back to the question. So Alberta is currently going through this process where they're introducing political parties into yeah. Calgary and Edmonton. What advice would you have perspective, give to prospective candidates about finding that party that would identify with them? Because there's a lot of concern in this province and they're looking at Quebec and saying, well, it works in Quebec City, it works in Montreal, works in Vancouver. What advice would you give to councillors or even prospective candidates to make a transition into a political party at a municipal level a little bit easier? Uh, that's a very good question. Like I said, uh, I, I don't know if, if it's politically correct for me to say so, but I would say fight it and don't accept municipal, uh, uh, sorry, party politics at the municipal level, because the amount of time that you spend preparing for your council for the attacks that you will get as they get at other levels of government, rather than focusing on your programs and your citizens is horrendous. As a taxpayer, I I, I'm totally against the amount of money that goes to pay the city councillors when they're spending time doing politics rather than working for the citizens. So again, probably not the answer you're looking for, but if not, if the system is going to be put in place, well, you know, make sure that the people you join teams with uh, share your values. I would say it's that's probably the basic. Um, and yeah. Uh, uh, so 
I want to turn to the life of a counselor in Quebec City because you you sit around a table with not just yourself, your one vote on that council that makes the decisions that are going to impact the people of Quebec City on a day to day basis. Unlike the other levels of government, you make a decision, the implications are going to be felt probably within a few days, or if not a week, Quebec, if it's uh, done at a provincial level, might be a month, federal might be two, three months, depending on, or even a year, depending on how slow things go. For you, how do you make the best decision for the city as a whole, while understanding that you're not going to please 100% of the people in your city? That's a really great question, especially in today's world where everything seems to be polarized, right? It's 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 gotten worse, I, I believe. Um, we could talk about the impact of social networks, but anyways, that's a different story. Um, so our, our team, one thing I really respect and enjoy about our team and, and, and our mayor, our current mayor, Bruno Marchand, is that we don't take decisions for political gain. We really take decisions for the future and what's necessary, be it for climate change or for what the city needs looking ahead into the future. And we even have a chair in uh, in our in our executive committee room that was created by um, uh, elementary school children. And it's to remind us that the decisions we're making today is for the future of, uh, of the city. So once we focus on that and keep that as, a, as our, as our uh, background for making these decisions, it makes it, a lot easier, I would say. Can I play devil's advocate with you, though, for a second on that statement? Absolutely. Because sure. Understandable, you have to look at your city or your community or your municipality in the the next generation's perspective. But the people here yep. and now want their issues dealt with. They want their problems solved. And I'm not bursting any bubbles here by when saying this, but... Things are tough out there right now across Canada. Yep. Inflation is at an all-time high, and you as a municipal councillor, you as a council, you as a city, impact people's day-to-day -day lives. So when you look at decisions that you have to make, you're the one who has to put your hand up. You're the one who has to vote on these issues. How do you ensure that you make the decision that is going to impact people in the next generation while not negatively impacting people today? We're, I think, very lucky. Quebec City has been very, very well managed, let's say, from a financial point of view. Because at the end of the day, we collect taxes, and then we have to figure out, decide how we're going to spend that money, right? I mean, it's, um, so we've been, we've managed to keep our tax increase despite the current economic situation at relatively low rates compared to other cities across the city and whatnot. So that's definitely something we focus on. Um, on the other hand. I think it's the approach. I think we're really lucky to live in such a peaceful city. So, for example, the biggest problem is uh, the biggest issue for citizens is snow removal. Everybody would like for the snow to be removed before the snow actually falls. Um, and it's funny because when I started, uh, it, it, I used to be on the defensive, right, and say, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? How do we improve this? And now I take a different approach. I will, like, grab somebody's elbow when they talk to me and complain about snow removal and say, you know what? I'm so happy that that's the biggest problem you have. And because when you think about what's going on in other places in the world, it's fantastic that our biggest issue is snow removal, for example. So I, I would say we do balance between, you know, how is it right now, especially for the economy, how is this going to impact people's ability to do other activities? We know it's difficult. Um, you know, there's a housing crisis right now. So, um, which I'm assuming also, we're going to talk about in a few seconds here, but I yeah, want to ask one probably. last question before we sure. talk about the city, uh, the Quebec city as a whole. Um, I have noticed in my conversations with municipal leaders, and I have noticed from an outsider's perspective that people are tuned out of what's going on at city hall. As long as my garbage is picked up, my water's turned on and the snow is cleared to an appropriate level. I truly don't understand what's going on at City Hall. And I'm saying that in a broad stroke, and I hate to paint a broad stroke. In Quebec City, for yourself, do you get a sense that there's an apathy in the city where they people don't understand what's going on at City Hall? Or do you think people are tuned in and engaged on the issues of what's actually happening in your communities? No, they're not. And for example, we now have 21 um, uh, city councillors. I uh, used to be 37, and the city's merged here about 20 odd years ago. Nobody knows 
uh, city official except for the mayor. Or it's very rare the people who know their own city council or their own district, their own borough. Well, the borough they'll maybe know, but but so yeah. So no, I would say the majority of people are not aware of what goes on at city hall. And also, as you know, the media landscape has changed tremendously. So whereas before everybody followed the same you know, three TV stations and two newspapers, that's not the case anymore. So getting the information out to the whole of the population is not as easy as it may have once been. So yeah, no, I, I, people aren't aware of most issues that we deal with. And also people aren't necessarily aware of what is which level of government's responsibility. Um, so uh, for myself, I think our duty is to sort of say, not brush it off and say that's not our responsibility, because at the end of the day, these are people living in our neighborhoods, in our districts or whatnot. So at least make it a point to lobby with the higher level of government uh, or explain to them why we can't, but not just to brush it off. I think that's very important. You, you took my follow-up question out of my mouth, so thank you so much Sorry. for that. Uh, I want to turn to Quebec City as a whole now, and I, before I ask my first question, as I, I'm going to preface it by saying this, this is the conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send me emails, please note that this is his opinion and his opinion <laughs> alone. That being said, councillor, in your opinion, yes. as of recording this episode on June 21st, 2024, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing Quebec City today? It's it's certainly the housing crisis. Uh, right now, we, we did deploy an accelerated uh, housing plan to gain 80,000 new units in the next 16 years. Um, our level of uh, inoccupancy, is that how you say it in English? I believe so. It's really fascinating. I'm more Anglophone than Francophone, but I've been working in French for the last three years, so now I'm looking for my English word sometimes. Anyhow, uh, it's about 1%, and, and in some districts, even lower than that, the um, the vacancy rate, uh, which is horrible. You need to have a, at least 3% for there to be a balanced market. So right now, that's our biggest issue, is we need to build and what's difficult for us, and again, thank you for prefacing it. This is my opinion as city councilor, not the city's opinion. Definitely important to say that. It's very difficult with the, um, so here in Quebec, and Alberta is actually going in the same direction from what I understand, but we don't have access directly to federal programs. It has to go through the provincial government first, which it typically does, but it can add six, nine months, a year of negotiating before we actually get funds from some of the great programs to be able to be it build housing or, or other activities. So yeah, that's our biggest issue right now, uh, I would say. So you, you've you come to the realization, like I have probably, that municipalities do not build houses though. They're not going out there building houses. Scott Pierce, the former president of FCM said it best. We don't want to see a house built by Scott Pierce, the mayor of the township of Gore. But what you do, what are, you are responsible for is the infrastructure. You're the ones who are laying the pipe, the groundwork, and the actual uh, zoning of different areas to get developers in to build those houses. Yeah. Is the city of, is Quebec City set up so that if a developer comes there tomorrow and says, we want to build a 20 story uh, building or a fourplex apartment a complex in this street, that Quebec City will say, sure, let's do it. Here's the permits. Here's the approvals. Go at it. Or are you looking at more infrastructure investments that you need to put in place before that target of 16,000 or 16,000 uh, new 80, houses, oh. 80,000 yeah. new houses are put into place? So it, it's a bit of both. I'd say there, there are a lot of zoning regulations and um, our uh, uh, territorial management group gets a lot of requests and it takes a certain time of analysis. And we do have a public public consultation policy in place, which adds time. I'd say that we do need, we are working on seeing how we can accelerate some of those procedures because it can be very lengthy before somebody gets a permit. But um, we're certainly pro let's build and get this uh, housing up. Now, as you may or may not have heard, Quebec was also for the last, now it's been at least 12 years, I believe, working on a getting a, 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 a good transit system in place because we've been using buses and it's not necessarily the most efficient. So that's also been stalling development because obviously if you, and now it's been approved now by the provincial government finally. So we will be building a tramway. So obviously you want to build 
along the tramway line so that people have easy access to the transportation system. But there was kind of like a standstill among promoters and developers because they weren't sure is that project going to go through or not. So now I'd say we're going to work really hard to try to be as efficient as possible in meeting those permits. And already uh, the percentage of um, of uh, new uh, development projects that are up and around, I think uh, this month were the, the, the top increase in Canada. So we're pretty proud of that and happy about that. I, I recently chatted with the mayor of Charlottetown, uh, PEI Philip Brown, for the show, and he I, we talked we talked about um, the historical aspect of his city. Quebec City is a historic community. It's one of the only, if not if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, UNESCO heritage sites that is the, dedicated to their downtown core. Is it hard to grow your community, grow your city? when you have to preserve the history that is known around the world and even throughout Canada for being one of the most historic communities in Canada? Is it challenging to build and grow your community while trying to preserve the past from a council's perspective? So yes and no, it depends where in the city. Obviously what we call, you know, the walled city, uh, that's a lot more complex. Yeah. Um, however, that that makes Quebec City's charm, so we wouldn't want to lose that anyways. But in general, for the rest of the areas and the, the boroughs, the, it's not as complicated as within the city. So certain projects will be more complex, but but not the majority, I would say. The one area that most people forget about when we talk about growth of cities and what all parties need to come together, whether it be the federal, the provincial, and the municipal governments, is the residents. Do you get a do you get a sense that there's buy-in from the community that they want to see Quebec City grow in a sustainable way that their children, their next generation of family who moves here or is born today has a place to call their own in Quebec City tomorrow? I think Quebec City is a—it's an interesting place because it's—it's it's not a big city, but it's not a village either. It's kind of like right there in between. Um, yet it is probably a one degree or two degrees of separation, where you still have that feeling of having access to pretty much everybody in the city. So I would say it is a little bit more conservative uh, for the most part. Uh, but I think human beings in general we don't like change, and depends what kind of change you've experienced in your life. So there is a lot of. Um, of pushback uh, for some developments, for example, we'd like, uh, well, personally, as a city councilor, I would like to see higher buildings because it's it's a better use of land if you build vertically than horizontally and to minimize uh, urban sprawl, which unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, we have the most amount of highways per capita in Quebec City. And that's just because it was built as most Canadian cities at the same time as the uh, auto industry sort of took off. So that's a bit of a challenge. So yes, there's pushback. Um, I wouldn't be able to quantify in terms of percentages, but but at the same time, it's interesting because when it comes to social housing, uh, then uh, the population is very favorable and there isn't hardly any pushback at all, uh, which is surprising. But at the same time, you do get, like I'm sure in all municipalities, not in my backyard. It's a great idea, but not here. Do it somewhere else. So, um, And I can't speak for other cities because Quebec City is where I've it is the only city I know how, how that works. So, yeah. Um, okay. I have like two questions I want to ask, and I, I have to go back to an original question I asked, and it's sure. about the role of council and the role of a counselor. When you're making decisions based on your community, based on Quebec City as a whole, you call yourself an entrepreneur, but you're a politician as well. You're a community member. You're a counselor. You're a counselor for the plateau area of Quebec City. When you look at individual issues, what perspective do you first put them through? Do you put them through a community perspective? Do you put them through an entrepreneur's perspective? Or do you put them through a Quebec City perspective when you're voting on issues around housing, around infrastructure, around service levels? Because that then quantifies my next question that I'm going to ask that I should have asked it okay. beforehand. Go sure. Ahead. It's like a choose your own adventure. Yeah, um, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, a community first for 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 myself as a as a council person. Um, definitely, what are the needs of the community? That's the first question I ask myself. Afterwards, uh, how do we make that fit in with the the city's vision? Um, interestingly enough, we are right now in the process of uh, redefining a vision for the city in terms of urban and mobility uh, for twenty fifty. So we're right. This exercise is just started now, so it's a great time to be part of uh, of council. 
And then what I have to do for my entrepreneurial side is kind of put that aside uh, because things are not going to go as quickly as I know they could. Uh, sometimes, and, and, and I shouldn't say this, we have fantastic people, by the way, working at the city. We have about 5,000 employees, some part-time, not all full-time. And I believe everybody has good intentions, but there are rules and regulations and, and uh, people follow the rules and regulations and don't necessarily think outside the box. That's something we would like, I would like for us to improve. Hopefully I will get another mandate to be able to try to work on the culture. Because the way I compare it sometimes is, um, especially right now, we had a bit of a heat wave in Quebec City. So I imagined uh, a community organization outside of um, a corner store. And imagine that the corner store was owned by the city way up top or had a chain of corner stores. So you've got the community person who's who wants to get water for people who are really, really thirsty because it's heat wave. They're at the corner store, the door is locked. Politically, we've said we're going to open up the door because we know that people need water. But by the time it trickles down to the person who actually has the key, it takes a lot of time. And I know where that person is and where that key is, but I'm not allowed to talk to that person, which is fine. I understand you don't want to start having council people giving orders or telling people what to do. But that I find difficult. So what I have to do is put the entrepreneurial side aside for a little bit and think about, okay, it's going to take a little bit more time, but in the long run, a system will be put in place that will be able to serve more people. Okay. So the reason I asked that question, because you said you look at things from a community perspective. Now, yeah. again, I apologize if I'm wrong here, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you were not elected at large. You're not elected by every single person in Quebec City. You're rep you're elected by a, a district award, uh, the area of, uh, again, Plateau, if I'm getting, right. pronouncing that right. So how do yeah. you put, how do you put a community uh, mindset on issues like infrastructure, like water, like buildings, when right. you know that there's a limited supply of money that you get every year, municipalities do not have an endless supply of money as much as people think they do. So that yeah. means when you vote on things, you're not voting on just your area or your what your area is going to get. You're voting on everything. So when you look at the challenges, do you look at it as a Quebec City challenge or a plateau challenge? So... Uh, every year when we do our, we vote on our budget, um, we have obviously our annual budget. It's about $1.9 billion right now for Quebec City. But we also, it used to be a five-year plan. Now it's a 10-year plan, specifically based around infrastructure. So we know, our experts at the city know which areas are going to need more infrastructure. And that's kind of planned out, unless, of course, there are emergencies, at which point that'll, uh, that's, that's decided, well, it's voted on by council. Uh, by council, but it's decided by the administration that's in place, and uh, they know they know their stuff. We've got great people, so uh, we try not to interfere and stay at a higher level, kind of like as if we were a board of directors, right? Understandable. I want to turn to uh, the flip side of my original question for this segment and talk about what's the thing you're proud about when you look at the city as a whole. Looking at the government perspective, looking at the council's perspective, looking at the administration's perspective. What's the thing that you go, you know what, we have our challenges, which every municipality does in this country. But at the end of the day, we've got this going for us. What is that X factor for Quebec City, for yourself, that you can go to FCM, to go to other municipal leaders across Quebec and say, you know what, you're doing it good, we're doing it better. I think it's, uh, and actually just recently we won an award from the provincial government for being uh, the city without racism for all the efforts that we're doing in terms of being very welcoming uh, for from uh, for people coming from outside the country, uh, but yet working to integrate them into our or to adapt to the to to, to our culture and whatnot. But that's something I'm personally proud of because that's why I got involved in politics. But I think if I think of the city as a whole, it's it's such a safe and peaceful and wonderful place, and I think that's what um, is really amazing about Quebec City. It's clean, it's safe, people are friendly. Um, but mind you, you get that Canada in general, people are so friendly and, and overly polite, let's say. Uh, okay. But I think we're doing that right. So you've mentioned the word inclusion a few times, and I I, I want to ask the question. So I'm going to cut the next segment a little bit shorter than I usually do. What does inclusion mean to yourself 
as a guy grew up in Quebec City, Jewish uh, background, moved to Toronto, comes back, gets integrated into the community, sees a horrific event unfold in his in his community, runs and tries to make the city even more inclusive for more people. What does an inclusive Quebec City mean to Councillor Weiser? So there's a little saying that I kind of developed when I was working with that group before I got involved in uh, in politics, which is, uh, I'm going to have to translate it live here because I never really use it in English, but it's uh, be, proud, be proud of our roots, share them with others without imposing, respect other people's roots, and especially let's create new ones together. And that's how I see inclusion for myself. Um, I think, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying, wow, that's a heavy statement. That's a pretty big ask of people. Do you think people are up to that task of being accepting and inclusive of people? Well, I think we have, we, we have to, and, and in any case, I'm not really, I didn't really invent anything. If you look at the evolution of, of humankind, there's never been a point in time where culture, language, science hasn't changed. I'm not going to say evolved because sometimes people say hasn't gone evolved means positive. Um, but it, it's it's constant change. And sometimes I have a feeling that we're so self-centered that we don't realize how we're really specks, like we're grains of sand in a universe of space and time. Don't need to get too philosophical. I apologize. But things are going to change. So it's better to put it out there and say, wait a second, why am I um, resistant, uh, resisting this change? Because it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Or I hear people sometimes I'm saying, oh, I'm doing this for my grandchildren and their children. Well, I like to ask people, do you remember your great grandparents or your great great grandparents and what bond you have with them? Because it goes both ways. Like they're not really going to care about you. They're not going to know you. They're going to be living their own lives. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that okay. answers your question. But... It, it does. But so I'll, I'll yeah. continue. I just want to turn to my last segment now. Because there's a big event coming up, literally about five days after this episode is airing. So this episode airs on Wednesday. On July 3rd, there's a major event. And I'm a big fan of tourism. I think tourism is an economic driver that municipalities need to tap into, and they haven't been able to. We always talk about the great things about the tourism industry across Canada, but at a local level, there's lots to talk about. In Quebec City, what are some of the tourist things that people should experience if they come through this summer? Oh, geez. It's, 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 yeah. So tourism is obviously one of our biggest industries in Quebec City. I mean, uh, we're one of the top destinations in the country and really proud of that as well. So obviously, just taking in the old city, um, it just breathes of history. And as you mentioned, we're a UNESCO heritage uh, site. Uh, so obviously, you want to be taking that in, our Plains of Abraham. Uh, interestingly enough, I was talking to somebody at our tourism office who was saying that the, the most visited destination, aside from the Chateau de Frontenac, which people just sort of walk around in the old city, uh, and rumor has it that it's the most photographed uh, hotel uh, in the world, although I don't know what scientific study has been done, but that's been around for, for, for ages. Um, but it's the Mont Montmorency Falls, which is about a 12, 15 minute drive out from Quebec City. Uh, which is a really popular location. And then making one's way out to the Huron Wendat Nation, Wendaki, uh, which is fantastic as well. They've done a great job. They have their powwows over the summer. Um, by the way, that's something else. And I'm sorry, it's something you mentioned, you asked about before. Something I'm really, really proud of uh, for the city is the relationship we have with the Huron Wendat Nation. It's phenomenal. I think it's exemplary for the rest of the country. We've just recently included them. So we have uh, grant programs for our businesses, which is mostly funded by the provincial government, but it's a delegation of power and we can decide how we spend that money. Um, anybody on the in the Huron Nation, Huron Wendat Nation, can also apply for our municipal grants. So it's very, very seamless and working on projects together with the uh, Huron Wendat Nation. So sorry, want to bring that back. I forgot, I should have mentioned it before. That's something definitely tourists uh, might want to take advantage of. And then it's the the plethora of fantastic restaurants. I mean, the, 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 the cuisine here is really amazing. And of course, you, you have to have a poutine when you're in Quebec City. But yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold your feet to the fire here and ask you a little bit of a Sophie's Choice question and be Dustin Hoffman or Meryl Streep if you want. But at the end of the day, 
is there a place that you go? Is there a spot that you go that you go, you know what? After a long day of council meetings, I need to get away, re decompress, refocus, recenter myself and go back at it tomorrow, understanding that I need to leave the community better off than I left it the day before. There's, I would say there's two places that I go to. One is my corner restaurant. It's it's just a corner restaurant. It's comfort food. It's people from the neighborhood. And the other is to go back to the food bank. Um, the food bank with one of the biggest community organizations in my district or actually in the whole borough. And that's why I got involved in politics is for community. So when I need to decompress and focus and some stress relief, I go back and, and hang out with, with people essentially. And that grounds me and reminds me of why I'm doing what I'm doing. My last question for you, because I'm just cautious of time here, and I know you're a busy man. Um, I want to ask one question, but I'm going to ask you to do a favor for me. Don't answer it in sure. English, answer it in French if possible, because I think it's sure. going to be more impressive. And I, I want to give shout out to the people of Quebec City with this question. What makes the city of Quebec, Quebec City, such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Donc, je ne voudrais pas en français. Québec, c'est un, une ville où il fait bon vivre. C'est magnifique, c'est tranquille. C'est l'hiver, il y a des parcs, il y a des infrastructures, il y a de la culture, il y a des événements d'envergure internationale. On a un festival d'été incomparable. On a quatre saisons qu'on peut vivre. Les couleurs à l'automne sont fantastiques. Et puis, pour l'instant, tout est à 15 minutes. On peut être dans le centre-ville et à 15 minutes, on est dans les montagnes, dans les boisés. Donc, on, on peut faire de l'activité physique, de la culture, du sport. Um, tout est ici dans la ville de Québec. Well, counselor, thank you for that. First off, I, I think I got about 90% of that. So my French is coming along. So I do appreciate your time, your energy to sit down with me and talk about Quebec City, talk about your role in uh, municipal governments, but also your duty to serve. So thank you so much for doing this. I greatly appreciate it. Well, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, when you're in Quebec, make sure to reach out. This summer, coming through, got an RV, taking seven dogs across Canada. It's going to be fun, me and my husband. So it's going to be an exciting journey to visit all these communities up close and personal. But thank you so much for doing this. Excellent. My pleasure. Thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Before we go, I just want to take a moment here and say that as a show, we try to always grow try to always expand. And over the last year and a half, we have failed in that mission in some sense, because there is an important part of this country that we have failed to uh, get into. And that is Quebec, the second largest province in this country. And we as a host, as a show, and as an organization have failed to do our due diligence in uh, extending an olive branch into the province of Quebec. So after FCM this year, I made a pledge on this show that by 2025, I will have a full-length conversation with a guest from Quebec in French. I know that is a large task, and I'm going to go back into my high school French class lessons, and I'm going to learn as much as possible between now, June 2024, and January 1st of 2025. Because when we return in 2025 for our very first episode in February, we are going to do an entire episode in French because we think it's important to also adhere and to showcase the great work that Quebec municipal leaders are doing. And to do that... I need to do better. So this is my pledge to the people who are listening to this right now. In 2025, we will have a full-length interview with not only one, but many full-length interviews with more municipal leaders in Quebec in the French language. So thank you so much for tuning in for another great episode. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button to stay in the loop with all their great conversations that we have coming up over the month of July and in the later half of 2024. Also, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. We are trying to expand, and the only way to do that is to grow. And to do that, we need supporters like yourself. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking. <laughs>